Good evening, and thank you for joining us. This is Matthew Allen. I'm one of the ministers here for the Cornerstone Church. We certainly appreciate you joining us tonight as Brother Don Truex is going to be joining us here in just a moment as we wrap up our 2021 summer series that the Cornerstone Church has put together. We, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, our summer series this year as we've talked about Christians and the culture. Hope you've been challenged, hope you've been encouraged, and hope you've been stimulated to go out into the world and be who you need to be for Jesus Christ. Christ. Brother Don Truex is a native of California, but after 27 years of living in Temple Terrace, Florida, he is a Floridian through and through. He and Vicki have two children, Josh and Heather, and two grandchildren, Jocelyn and Kellen. Florida College and Indiana University are his alma maters, Hoosiers, Dodgers, Lakers, Lightning, and Bucks are his passions. He has been privileged and truly blessed to preach in several countries and countless states, but loves being with his church family in Temple Terrace more than anything. It is our pleasure to introduce to you tonight Brother Don Truex as he speaks to us tonight on judges or messengers. Thank you. Well, good evening, Cornerstone Church. Wonderful to be with you tonight. Do you have a Bible with you this evening? Acts chapter 17. The 17th division of the book of Acts is where we will spend virtually all of our time tonight. And while you're opening your Bible and getting settled and ready to study with us, we welcome all of you. And I will tell you that I'm so happy to be with you tonight, to be a part of this very special series that you are engaged in and Christians in the culture. I know this has been a wonderful series for you. I've been able to track and follow so many of the speakers. All of these gentlemen have done such wonderful work and I'm happy to get to be a part of this series tonight. I so much appreciate this good church, appreciate the good you are doing and I really appreciate the great things that are happening among you, especially right now. I know that you're in a season of growth and I'm so very happy for that, so happy to be able to share with you again. Just a few years ago, we, uh, we shared a great gospel meeting together. I enjoyed that time with you very, very much and happy to be with you tonight. Appreciate your shepherds and the good invitation that they have extended to me. Certainly appreciate Matt, whom I've known uh, for several years now, and also Kane and the good work that they do with you. And tonight, glad to get to speak with you for just a bit now <clears throat> about judges or messengers as Christians in our culture. I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever had an appliance or some piece of electronics that you, uh, you, you just were sure was absolutely broken, uh, only to discover that in reality, it just wasn't plugged in? Well, that can be a little bit embarrassing, especially if you've already called somebody to come and do a repair. But life can be that way as well. You know, sometimes life doesn't work because we're not plugged in. We're not plugged into God or into his word or to fellowship into the community with the people of God. And the point of that is that we need the power of God flowing into our lives. By my desk here in Temple Terrace, I have a power strip. And so in order for that power strip to work, power has to flow into it. But if you look at a power strip, there's another side to that. And the other side is that while we need to be plugged into the power of God, we want to be able to allow others to plug into our lives as well. And so we need to provide a connecting place for other people to be plugged again into God and into his word and into fellowship, communion with the people of God. Somebody has <clears throat> well said that the church is the only organization on earth that exists for the sake of those who aren't a part of it yet. And that's a great statement, isn't it? Because we're not an exclusive club here. I mean, the church is not like Sam's Club or Costco, where we're not going to let you door, in the door unless you've got that membership card. Otherwise, sorry, you're going you're gonna to have to leave. You know, church is not like that at all. What did Jesus say? Whosoever will may come. Now, the challenge, of course, is reaching out in 2021 is daunting business. So many individuals view the church and Christian faith with suspicion or with mistrust. And it is intimidating, isn't it? I mean, after all, how am I supposed to share my faith with 105,000 at Ohio Stadium 
on a fall Saturday afternoon? Or how am I supposed to share my faith with 19,000 people at Value City Arena on a uh, winter uh, night? Or how about this? Just how about at the Ohio State Fair with thousands of people milling around? Or how can I even share my faith just with my neighbor a co-worker or a fellow student? How am I supposed to build bridges? How am I supposed to find common ground? How am I supposed to be a messenger to this culture so that they don't see me simply as somebody who is being judgmental? Well, <clears throat> the answer to that takes us tonight to Acts chapter 17. And I know you're good Bible students, so you know the story here. The Apostle Paul finds himself in Athens, Greece. Now today, you can go to Athens and you can find the remains of great buildings that Paul actually would have seen there 2,000 years ago. And so here is, for example, the Parthenon. In Paul's day, it would have looked a little more like this. And of course, there's a cutaway and a relief here, but it would have looked a bit like this. It was a beautiful structure. It was admired throughout the, throughout the world. And Athens, of course, was an amazing city. Some 250,000 people lived there. It was the center of philosophy and art. It was the cradle of democracy. It was known for athletics because, of course, the Olympic Games had their impetus right there. And in Acts chapter 17 and beginning in verse 19, the Apostle Paul is invited to speak at the Areopagus. And so they took Paul and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Now, when, when Paul was invited to the Areopagus, we need to know that that word referred to both a place and to the people who met there. Now, in Paul's day, the place would have been a very impressive structure. It sat, as you can see, in the very shadow of the Parthenon. And the Areopagus is this area at the bottom of the image, at the bottom of the picture. And you can see it was rounded at the front. It was a very beautiful place. <clears throat> and again, it sat in the very shadow of these massive, beautiful buildings on the hillside. And so it was a very impressive place. It is not so very impressive, of course, today. But the people who met there, the Areopagus, that is the people, were influential people. They were important people who would discuss philosophy and current affairs and politics, and they would discuss religion. For Paul to be invited to be there and speak there would have been a great honor in that day. Imagine being invited to speak today to a joint session of Congress or to make a maiden speech, for example, to Parliament in England. Well, this is the kind of setting, for example, that this would have been. It's fascinating that in this account, Paul finds us or illustrates for us ways to find common ground, to be messengers to people with whom you would think that we had nothing common at all. We sometimes talk that way, don't we? Sometimes we'll say about somebody, you know what? We got nothing in common with them at all. Uh, we we love the Lord, they don't care about the Lord. We love our church family, they don't care about church at all. We care about living a righteous life, they don't care about living a righteous life at all. We have nothing in common with them. But of course we do, don't we? Because we all have, we all have a common problem, and that's sin. <clears throat> and there is one common solution to that problem, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, I want us to ask tonight, how do we find common ground? How is it that we can be more messengers rather than judges? Well, let's think about what Paul did in Acts chapter 17. He did four very distinct things. Number one, he opened his eyes. <coughs> he, opened, he opened his eyes. And I'm thinking about a statement in Acts 17, the beginning of verse 23, where it says, as I walked around, and looked, I want you to notice that, as I walked around, Paul says, I looked. He opened his eyes and saw what was going on in his culture. And that's extremely important. In verse number 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. 
That's important. He went to the synagogue and there he found <coughs> fellow Jews. But he also went to the Agora, the marketplace, and there he associated with Gentiles. It's interesting that Paul didn't just associate with fellow Christians. I think sometimes we think that that would be great. If we could just live our lives in insulation and isolation and only rub shoulders and deal with fellow Christians, that would be great. If we just wake up in a gated Christian community and get in our car and go to a job where only Christians worked and then drive home and stop by a grocery store that was owned and operated and frequented only by Christians before we go back to our gated Christian community, that somehow that would be absolutely great. And Jesus said, look, that wouldn't be great at all. I want your light to so shine among men that they can see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Paul said, we, yes, we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in this world. And so <clears throat> we need to be, of course, I love, I've always loved this statement from 1 Chronicles 12. We need to be like the men of Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what they should do. The only way we can do that is if we open our eyes and see what's going on in our culture. One of the things that I've so appreciated about this series in which you've been involved is that it's called upon us to take an open, honest look at the culture in which we live. And then we got to find ways to take Jesus into that world. And so we got to pay attention to the culture in which we live and the lives of those around whom we live. And we've got to look for signs of spiritual curiosity. Do you have your Bible? Acts 17, look at verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very, <clears throat> you are very religious. Now you may have a translation tonight that doesn't use the word religious, but uses the word superstitious. And so Paul says, I perceive that in all things you are very religious or superstitious. It's interesting that what was religion to the Greeks was superstition to the Apostle Paul. And yet, he doesn't begin <clears throat> by offending them, but rather by commending them for having an interest in spiritual matters. He could have offended them. Listen, everything I've seen is just superstitious. You people are foolish. This is ridiculous. But he doesn't do that. He begins by commending them for having spiritual interests. When I was thinking about this for this lesson, I thought about the fact, my wife, Vicki, <clears throat> Vicki and I have been married for 44 years. And about four years ago, somehow, some way out of the blue, she developed an interest in professional football. Now, she's never been interested in that. But she was interested because she started following, not the Tampa Bay Bucks, but she started following the New Orleans Saints. And the reason she liked the New Orleans Saints is because of their quarterback, who's recently retired, but their quarterback, Drew Brees. She loved Drew Brees. And so <clears throat> back in January this year, when the Tampa Bay Bucks were playing the New Orleans Saints to see who was going to go to the Super Bowl, we're watching that. And they're interviewing Drew Brees. And as they interview here, her, him, here's what Vicki says out loud. She says, I'll tell you, that is one beautiful man. And I looked at her and I said, Vicki, I'm standing right here. I can hear the words that you're saying. And she looked at me and said, I know. <laughs> well, I guess I could have taken offense at that. But instead of taking offense, I was just happy that she had an interest in watching football with me. And that's what Paul does here. He could have taken offense at their superstition, their idolatry. But he commends them, first of all, for an interest in spiritual matters. And he uses that brilliantly to segue into a discussion of the one true God. Look at verse 23. As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. What a brilliant use of Paul to use that as a bridge to talk about the one true God. The point of that is, ladies and gentlemen, that when we pay attention to our world and those in our world, 
we'll find <clears throat> we'll find we have similar concerns and interests. It will create opportunities once we begin to think in those kinds of terms. And so Paul, Paul opened his eyes. He saw what was going on in his world. But then secondly, he not only saw what was going on, but he cared about what was going on. He exposed his heart. Look at verse 16 with me. While Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. I like one of the newer translations that says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. He was greatly distressed. <clears throat> distressed is an interesting word. It's a word that literally means to needle or to poke or to jab. It's the same word, by the way, that's used in Hebrews 10 and verse 24 when the Hebrew writers said, let us consider one another how we may provoke, needle, poke, jab, provoke one another unto love and unto good works. And the point of that is that what Paul saw in Athens caused him pain. It made his heart ache. Because he saw religious people who seemingly were searching for God, and yet they were headed in the wrong direction. And his heart broke for them in that. He saw people debating philosophy, building temples, erecting statues, and yet their religion was empty, and their souls were empty, and that caused him pain. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, does it cause us any pain. You see, part of our challenge is that we live in an all-inclusive, everybody gets a trophy, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, God loves us anyway kind of world. And it's hard for us to realize sometimes that that neighbor that is so kind, that coworker who is so helpful, that fellow student who is so brilliant, that family member that is so loved, that all of these individuals, if they've never been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are, what's the Bible word? Lost. They are lost. And we've got to care about that. We've got to care about the fact that individuals in this world who've not been obedient to Jesus, that they are lost. The danger is that we will become apathetic and become desensitized to the fact that all of these people around us by whom we work or with whom we go to school or the people in our families or wherever it may be, it's easy to become desensitized to the fact that if they've not been obedient, they're lost. We get desensitized <clears throat> to so much in our culture. Another mass shooting another political scandal. It hardly even is a blip on the radar. In fact, <clears throat> this very week, there was a news story, national news, about another mass shooting. And it was about a 15 second blip on the screen and then it was over and done and gone. We can do that sometimes even in church. We can become desensitized in worship. Another song, another prayer, Another communion service, another sermon. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, heaven help us. Heaven help us if the gospel, if worship <clears throat> ever becomes boring to us. In verse 21 of Acts 17, listen to what it says. All the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You know, there are a couple of sides of that. <clears throat> we always quote that verse and give it a very negative connotation. And there is a negative side of that. And we'll, we'll mention that in just a second. But I got to tell you, there's a side of this verse that I kind of appreciate. I appreciate the fact, I appreciate the fact that these people were looking for new knowledge. You've known people, I've known people, we've all known people, and their box of knowledge years ago was closed and sealed and taped up tightly. And they were never going to let any new thought or idea come in there at all. And so I appreciate the fact that they were willing to at least think about, think about some new ideas and new thoughts. But this verse 
is quoted really, is used really in kind of a negative way. <clears throat> that these are individuals who just, they spent their time just, you know, they were bored it seemed. And so they're, they're just grasping for something. Doesn't that sound like much of our culture and society? We have so much new knowledge on a daily basis that it's cultivated in us kind of a microscopic attention span. And so we're all waiting, you know, for the, for the, the next fortnight or the next binge watch, or the next, and you fill in the blank there. We live in a generation that is often bored, seldom captivated by anything. And if we're not careful, Christianity can become that way to us. Faith can become that way to us. There's a <clears throat> book on the religious market entitled, Bored Again Christians. Not born again Christians, bored again Christians. But I got to tell you, if you had asked, if you had asked Peter or James or John what it was like to follow Jesus, they, they might have given you multiple descriptives, but bored would not have been one of them, I'll guarantee you. I mean, these men were with Jesus when he challenged the Pharisees, when he confronted the corrupt politicians, when he healed an ER full of people who needed healing. They went through storms with him. He, they fed thousands with Jesus. He challenged their mind. He pushed them out of their comfort zones. If we ever find Christianity boring, ladies and gentlemen, could it be that it's because we have not done what we have sung for generations? Could it be that we have not surrendered all to him? As I was preparing this lesson, I was reminded about a decade ago, I was privileged to go to the Bible lands, went to Israel, and then we crossed over into Jordan. But when we were in Israel at the Sea of Galilee, about that same time, there was a news story about an entrepreneur in Israel who, who had petitioned to be able to build at the Sea of Galilee. He wanted to build a land bridge 28 feet out into the Sea of Galilee and two inches below the surface of the water. And he was going to charge individuals to walk out on the land bridge because as they walked out on the land bridge, it would appear that they were walking on the water like Jesus did. And I thought to myself, how like man that is. People wanting to look like they're walking the way of Jesus and yet risking absolutely nothing at all. The Apostle Paul <clears throat> exposed his heart. This is a man who was going to walk with Jesus. And when he saw these people so far off, so far afield, so wrong in their thinking, it broke his heart. But following Christ and being a messenger to others is more than just emotion. And so third, Paul engaged his mind. He engaged his mind. Now, there are a lot of verses that say that. Let me pop a lot of them on the screen here for you. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, and he reasoned with the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Acts 17 and 2, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scripture. And then later in Acts 18 and beginning in verse 4, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, I want you to understand, please, that, that preaching in the New Testament is described as persuading people, reasoning with people, presenting a logical case for faith with people. For many years, I taught a Monday night teenage class here in Temple Terrace. <clears throat> and we'd have, we would have teenagers from all over Tampa Bay who would come and be a part of that class. And one of the books that I used one year was this book by Josh McDowell called Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. And I always liked the title of that book. It was really, the title was really better than the book. But what a great title. Don't check your brains at the door. Why not? Because you don't need to. You don't need to. Paul reasoned and reasoned and reasoned. There is no need to be afraid of trying to defend our faith. Well, but what, Don? If you come up against somebody has a very sharp mind, they are intelligent, they are, they're just smart and they're quick and they're wise, and, <clears throat> and they have a different philosophy and worldview than you do. Well, that's exactly what Paul faced in Athens. Look at this. There were a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and they began to debate with Paul. Well, <clears throat> these were sharp people. The Epicureans were hedonists. 
they believed that personal pleasure was everything. It was from the hedonists, the Epicureans, that we got the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry because when, tomorrow we die. Now, the Stoics were just exactly what their name implied. These people would have made good Brits, stiff upper lip, keep calm and carry on. Their philosophy was that you should never allow external circumstances to upset your internal equilibrium. Don't let things affect you. Well, there are a lot of people in 2021, particularly as we are coming out of and now seem to be kind of embroiled again in the pandemic, a lot of people who are trying to live by one of those two philosophies of life. Paul says both of those are dead ends. They're dead ends. And so in this verse, <clears throat> the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him and they asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others said, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And they call Paul a babbler. That's an interesting word. Now you, you may have a marginal note in your Bible that says babbler or literally seed picker because that's what the word meant. The word babbler here was not as we think in, in, American, par, in, in American parlance. Somebody who just talks on and on. That's not what it's talking about. The word literally meant a seed picker. It was like a bird that would peck in one place and then he would go over and he'd peck somewhere else and he'd go somewhere and he'd peck over here for a little while as he was scavenging for food. But babbler or seed picker was also used for religious teachers. Religious teachers would take some of this, and some of this, and some of this, and they would amalgamate that into a philosophy or school of thought, and they would teach that, that hybrid doctrine. Well, people still do that. People do that all the time today, ladies and gentlemen. How many people do you know who have said, they may not say it out loud, out loud but you know, they have a faith, they have a, they have a view of, of religion, where they have said, you know what? I'll take all the Beatitudes. I'll take all the fruit of the Spirit. I'll take eight of the Ten Commandments. And for good measure, I'll take once saved, always saved from Calvinism. And I'll take baptism for the dead from Mormonism just in case. And they amalgamate all that together. And that's the lens through which they see their religious faith. But Paul really wasn't doing that at all. You know what Paul was doing, ladies and gentlemen? He preached the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. That's what he was doing. He was preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And the resurrection becomes exceedingly important. If we're going to be messengers to the world, <clears throat> the, the key message is Jesus Christ and that he rose from the dead. Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection after his resurrection, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once as if inviting investigation and scrutiny. And don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is in fact the linchpin of Christianity. We could have had Christianity without Jesus walking on water, without Jesus turning water to wine. We could have had Christianity without Jesus feeding the 5,000. But you can't have Christianity without Jesus rising from the dead. That's why the same Apostle Paul said, I, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Somebody says, oh, but Don, oh, but Don, there are some things in the Bible that I don't understand. Well, you're right. There are some things in the Bible that are very difficult to understand, but you know what? I understand that Jesus rose from the dead. And somebody says, oh, but Don, there are hypocrites in the church. What are we going to do about that? And Christians are polarized from each other because of politics or because of race or because of other things. And, and that shouldn't be. And you're right. That should not be. But the fact of the matter is Jesus rose from the dead. And that is the ultimate reasonableness of our faith. And so Paul opened his eyes. He engaged his heart. And then he engaged his mind. And then forth... He connected his God. He connected his God. And so in Acts 17, beginning in verse 24, do you have your Bibles? Listen to what Paul says. He says to this audience, 
God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything. He gives to all life and breath and all things, and he is made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And drop down to verse <clears throat> number 30. Truly then, the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all men and that he has raised Jesus from the dead. Paul says, you know what? Let me tell you about the God you don't know. He said, the one true and living God, he created us in verse 24. Ladies and gentlemen, every person you meet is made in the image of God and should be treated accordingly. And he said, God doesn't live in temples made with hand. Can you imagine how much courage it took to say that when you were standing in the shadow of the Parthenon? And yet, this God, Paul argues, created us. And <clears throat> this God is close to us. And so he quotes literature with which everybody would have been familiar. Your own poets have said that in him, it's in him that we live and move. He is not far from each one of us. In fact, God is close to us. One of the names about Jesus of Nazareth is Emmanuel. He is God with us us. And this God will hold us accountable. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. You know, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, I think maybe we read that maybe with wrong inflection. We always read that about repentance as though it's, <clears throat> it's God threatening us. God says repent. And that's usually the way we re read that, isn't it? But you know what? Maybe that's not so much a threat as it is an opportunity. That now God gives everyone the opportunity to repent. The opportunity to turn your life around. The opportunity to go in a better direction. The opportunity to get your life on track. Here at Temple Terrace, <clears throat> we sometimes call ourselves the uh, the U-turn church. Because if you've ever been to our building, if you've ever visited here in Temple Terrace and come to worship with us, you perhaps noticed that when you come to our building, either when you arrive or when you leave, you've got to make a U-turn. And so if you can come to our building and turn directly into our parking lot, if you're going to go home the same way, when you leave our building, you'll have to go out and make a U-turn. And for some who are coming to our building, as you come to our building, you have to make a U-turn to get in our building, depending on which direction you're coming from. And so we talk about ourselves being the U-turn church because that's what God offers us. That's what every local church should be. It should be the place where there is a warmth and embrace, a welcome to those who are willing to repent, to go in a better direction, to, to make a U-turn in their life, to get their life back on track. That's what God provides for us. No wonder in Acts 2, when, when, the, when, the pen, when Peter said, look, you, <clears throat> this same Jesus whom you crucified, God's made him Lord in Christ. Immediately they said, what, what can we do about that? And Peter's answer was that in his grace and mercy, God allows you to repent, to change directions, to turn your life around, to go in a better trajectory in living. Thank God that he allows us to repent. He's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained. And he brings us back to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. <clears throat> That's the assurance of that. All right. Before we stop tonight, I've got about five minutes or so left. Before we stop tonight, as we talk about being messengers to the world, <clears throat> I want to talk about what you can do, what you can do, not your sainted grandparents or your mom and dad or not the elders, <clears throat> not the elders at Cornerstone or Matt or Cain, but I, I want to talk to you about what you can do as a messenger of Jesus Christ. What can you do in evangelism? And I'm going to tell you something. There are things that you can do, and it doesn't matter 
if you are 14 or 40. In fact, it doesn't matter if you are 8 or 18 or 80. There's some things that you can do in evangelism. It doesn't matter <clears throat> if you didn't finish elementary school or if you have a PhD. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. I want to give you four things that everybody can do as a messenger of Jesus in evangelism. You can do these four things. It doesn't take any special training. You don't have to go to a class about how to do evangelism. There are four things that you can do. <clears throat> and so I want to give these four things to you to take home tonight. Here they are. <clears throat> number one, number one, you can shine. You can shine your light. You can shine your life. That's what Jesus said. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. It simply means that wherever you are, live your life in such a way that the gospel is enhanced and never diminished. Paul talked about that a lot. He said in Titus 2, look, you live your life in such a way so that those who are opposed to the gospel may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. You live your life that way. He said in Philippians 1 and verse 27, conduct yourself worthy of the gospel. He said in Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6, walk worthy of the gospel. In other words, show by your life that Christianity makes a real tangible difference in the way that you relate to your family, the way you do your job Monday through Friday, <clears throat> the way you interact with your friends, you live in such a way that your light shines. You can do that. That doesn't take any special training. You can live a Christian life. Secondly, you can speak. You say, well, Don, no, hey, I, I can't. I, I can't preach. I, I could never teach a public Bible class. You don't have to. That's not what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm saying is that we can all learn to season our speech with references to God because we all naturally talk about things that are of interest to us. Look, I've been with you all in a gospel meeting. I know, I know in the environment in which you live that, <clears throat> that you all have no difficulty at all talking about the Ohio State Buckeyes. You can talk about this upcoming football season. Then when basketball comes, you can talk about that because that's of natural interest to you. See, we talk about, we don't have any trouble talking about our kids. We don't have any trouble talking about our grandkids. Why? Well, because those things matter to us. Those things are important to us. And we can learn, we can begin to infuse concepts of God, His Word, God's people, church, faith. We can learn to do that if we'll just think about that. Our problem is that often we don't think in those terms. We don't think about how to incorporate God in our conversations. But it's easy once we try. You know, one of the, one of the <clears throat> most interesting conversion stories that I've ever been a part of is that here in Temple Terrace, we, in 1999, there was a new Starbucks that opened. Uh, I remember because I was driving by and they were putting the sign up for the Starbucks and I pulled off the side of the road and offered a prayer of thanks for, for Starbucks because I love Starbucks. I love coffee. Well, through the years, they've had a variety of managers <clears throat> in that particular store, as Starbucks always does. But they had one that was exceptional. She was outstanding. She was a very interesting lady. Her name was Wendy, and she came from Chicago. And she was named for the Windy City, Chicago. Her name was Wendy. Well, I graduated from high school just outside the city of Chicago. And so we would talk a lot about Chicago. We'd talk about the city, about things we liked in the city, like to do in the city. She was a very interesting lady, and I liked her very much. She was a very happy, gregarious kind of lady. She worked often on Sunday mornings because nobody was there, and she could get a lot done. Well, I go into that Starbucks early, early on, on Sunday morning, usually about 6.45 or 7 o'clock. <clears throat> and so Wendy would be in there by herself, and we'd visit for a little while. And I asked her one Sunday, I said, hey, Wendy, listen, I come and see you where you work all the time. When are you going to come and see me where I work? And she said, oh, Don. She said, if I came in a church building, the roof would just collapse. And I said, oh, Wendy, we, we got a pretty strong roof. I mean, we, we, we got a pretty strong building. I, I think it could handle even you. And she said, ah, Don, thanks, but 
but no thanks. I said, well, okay. So two or three weeks later, I didn't say anything for a while, but a couple of weeks later, same situation, Sunday morning early, nobody in there but me and her. And I said to her again, I said, Wendy, listen, I'm serious now. I come and see you all the time where you work. <clears throat> I want you. I want you to come see me where I work. And she said, well, I'll think about it. So a couple of Sundays later, in between Bible class and worship, <clears throat> I look back, and there's Wendy. <clears throat> and she's standing against the back wall. So when the class is over, I go back to her, and I said, Wendy, man, we are so glad to have you here. And she said, Don, I know a lot of these people. I said, sure you do. We all, we all love coffee. And I said, come down here and sit with Vicki and me. And she did. And so I asked her then afterwards, I said, Wendy, would you, would you study the Bible with me? And she agreed. And lo and behold, about six weeks later, I offered the invitation on a Sunday morning. And here comes Wendy down the aisle. And she wants to be baptized. And I baptized Wendy. And a year and a half later, wouldn't you know, I was able to perform her wedding ceremony to a wonderful young Christian man. And it all began because I just found a way, a non-threatening way, a non-judgmental way to just invite her to come and see. And really, that's the third thing everybody can do. Everybody can invite. Everybody can invite somebody to come to worship. Just come to worship with us. Just come and see. I mean, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen? They might say no. Well, I think we could probably survive that. Just invite them to come and see. You know, Jesus said, look, go into all the world. But it really was saying, go into your world. Go to where you do life. Let your light shine. Speak for me and invite others to do what, what was done in the early days of the gospel. Just come and see. And then finally, we've got to welcome those who accept our invitation and come to worship with us in our assemblies. We've got to make sure that they are welcome. You know, in James chapter 2, James implied <clears throat> that we're going to pay special attention to the visitors in our services. And we need to do that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what did Paul say? When an unbeliever comes into our service, when he leaves, he may not understand everything that went on, but he should be able to observe our worship and say, God is among those people. Everybody can do these three things. We can shine and speak and invite and welcome. You can do that. You can do that this week. And in fact, I know that you all are doing an amazing job of this from the number of visitors that you're having in your services. And I thank God for that. But we can all be involved in doing this. Well, it's been great to be with you tonight. You know, as Acts 17 ends, there are three responses. It says at the end of the chapter in verse 32 that there were some who just rejected. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they said, we're finished. We're done with you. Not going to listen to that anymore. But there were some who said, you know what? We'd kind of like to hear a little more about that. We're willing to have some dialogue. We're willing to study about that. That's a great beginning place. And then there were some who believed and became Christians. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we're not responsible for what someone does with Jesus Christ and with the gospel. We are responsible for bringing the message of the gospel and resurrection to those who don't know Jesus. That's our responsibility. And we can take that message because we can shine and speak and invite and welcome. Thank you for listening so wonderfully well tonight. We'll pray together and then be finished. Lord God, thank you so much for the privilege of being your children. And thank you, dear God, for the writing the Holy Spirit preserved in the book of Acts chapter 17 so that we could learn from your servant Paul how to build a bridge, how to be a messenger to those who need so desperately to know your son. And we pray, holy God, that we will open our eyes to the culture in which we live and that we will, in fact, expose our heart and be greatly distressed over those who do not know you and that we will, in fact, engage our mind and that we will, in fact, reason from the scriptures regarding your son and his resurrection. And then we pray, holy God, we pray that all of us will be the people who will engage with others <clears throat> to help them know, help them know your son to connect 
others to you, our God. We're grateful that we can study about these things. Thank you for the Cornerstone Church. Thank you for the wonderful work that they are doing. And we ask you, O oh God, to bless them greatly in the days that lie ahead. And help all of us to be your instruments, your messengers for your son, Jesus Christ, in the culture in which we live. We pray to you tonight in your son's powerful name. And amen.